it is difficult to show proper respect to people who you don't know. And it is difficult to truly know people unless you know them both as individuals, but also as peoples, the various groups and connections they have and which inform who they are. And it was with that in mind that I want us to think about our topic today, which is Relatives Revisited. I'm making a reference to several weeks ago when we did a lecture on relatives, and we talked about the social and political organization of Tikatnu, Kukinlet, Sungakik, prior to colonialism. We talked about, for example, Mung Dinaina people, the band, village, family, clan, moiety structure that organized people's lives. We also talked about Shukpiak villages and their social organization and how things were politically run there. But it's been over 200 years since that kind of time period that we were talking about and since the arrival of colonialism. So the question is, what has become of Cook Inlet today? What are the political arrangements? What are the social arrangements that structure people's lives? So among other things, we'll talk about tribes, corporations, migration, and diversity in our region today. And diversity is a good word for it. Um, we have a very, very diverse space, whether we're talking religiously, um, I hear a picture of old believers in Nikolaevsk, uh, southern Kenai Peninsula, uh, whether we're talking about the very large percentage of people from the many different Alaska Native groups. I uh, hear you see a performer at Native Youth Olympics, which is awesome, and you should definitely go to if you ever get a chance. Um, we see here, again, that census data we talked about before that shows that some of the parts of Anchorage are the most racially slash ethnically diverse censuses in the U.S., and that's kind of dividing up into several of the groups recognized by the U.S. census, and then like looking at which has the most sort of even percentages, so Anchorage ranks really high on that. Um, the, we have people from a variety of different national backgrounds, a relatively large um, presence of people from migrant communities. And so in many different ways, we are a diverse community, and that's what we'll be talking about today and getting into that more. And first to talk about that, I'd like to talk about international migration to Alaska, which of course has been going on um, since the very first arrival of Russians into Alaskan space. Uh, however, it's since then, uh, there's been a variety of other ways in which people have come from other countries into Alaska. Um, more recently, that has in the 20th and 20 in the late 19th and 20th and then early 21st centuries uh, we've had many many people come to alaska from a variety of different countries um, if, in fact anchorageites i don't know if that's actually what you're called i tried to look it up on google and google couldn't help me and if google can't help you who can so anyways i wasn't sure what the term for resident of anchorage is but folks that live in anchorage one out of ten are born in another country so that's pretty incredible if you think about it and coming from all over to really diverse um, mexico many people from samoa um, very large percentage of or very large number of people from the Philippines, um, people from Korea, people from Ukraine, Thailand, Laos, um, including our large number of people who are um, Hong, Hmong, um, people from Dominican Republic, many different people. So folks from all over. Um, we also have many refugees here in Alaska. So um, refugees as well as asylum status, those have specific legal meanings within U.S. law as well as world law and um, agreements among the U.N. and other groups, um, starting really in the 1950s where a lot of that started getting um, formalized within bodies like the U.N. And then we have what in the U.S. is the Re Refugee Act of 1980, uh, where basically folks that are refugees, these would be people typically who cannot return to their homelands because they have uh, what the U.S. calls a credible fear of persecution um, based on, let's say, racial reasons, religious persecution, whatever the case may be, political affiliation. Um, so refugees, though, they with the Refugee Act of 1980, if somebody's formally recognized as a refugee, then they have within one year can be receive permanent residency and within five years can apply for citizenship for naturalization. Um, and the number of refugees that come to the United States is set by the executive branch um, in a through presidential, what are sometimes called quotas, that can be set for a variety of reasons. For example, it's sometimes done for political or policy reasons. So right now with the invasion of Ukraine, um, of course, President Biden has announced um, you know, numbers of or goals of Ukrainian refugees to welcome into the United States. And so that changes over time uh, where different refugees are coming from. As refugees enter the United States, there are, um, it's a situation where people need in a sense a sponsor 
Um, and that's, that sponsor is either a family member. So if folks have a family member, then they're sort of sponsored by that family member and will often go live in the state wherever their specific family member lives. Let's say they have a, a cousin in Michigan or something. So they go and live uh, near their cousin in Michigan as part of where um, they're told to go live when they first move to the states. But the other um, common thing is if somebody doesn't have family already here, then there are 10 refugee resettlement kind of organizations that cover different regions and areas within the United States, and they help to figure out um, what states, what communities would be the logical place for that person to move to, for that person to be located at. And so a certain number of people end up in Alaska, uh, sometimes directly through that refugee resettlement program, or sometimes because uh, folks have migrated to another area and then uh, eventually to Alaska. So um, we have refugees from several different locations in Alaska, among them Kosovo, Sudan, Somalia, Laos, um, particularly Hmong refugees. Um, and then currently we are, I would suspect, will receive quite a few uh, Ukrainian refugees. And I hope that we can be a welcoming com community uh, to folks that cannot at present moment return to their homeland. Uh, interesting fact about refugees that you may or may not be aware of, um, the vast majority of refugees in the world um, end up in countries very close to them, right? Places where they flee immediately from their country, usually a bordering country or a pretty close by country, uh, typically in Africa and Asia are where we have the most refugees. And so, with obvious exception of what's currently going on in Ukraine, and so some of the and so of those people that go to really close by countries, um, actually 99% end up staying in one of those countries or eventually going back to their homeland. Um, so some of the places in the world that have like the most refugees per capita are places like Lebanon, for example. Um, so not often what you might have thought, you may not have realized that. The US receives, so sorry, so 1% then of the refugees in the world then go from those sort of secondary countries, as we sometimes say, to tertiary countries like the US, um, like Japan, like Australia, like any other number of nations, um, like Ecuador, wherever it is that they're ending up. But a tertiary nation, that's only 1% of the total refugees, which tells you given how many refugees are received in the United States, just how many refugees there are globally, if that's only 1% that are getting resettled into other parts of the world beyond those first stopover countries. Um, in the U.S., we have about 773,000 refugees in the United States, and the numbers that we've received over time has varied a lot depending on who's the president, to be kind of blunt about it. Under the Obama administration, uh, the number of refugees being received was around 100,000. Then under the Trump administration, it went down to... Um, it was in the very low thousands. I, I don't want to say too low and have misstated, but I think somewhere around 20,000. Under the Biden administration, um, it is now at about 65,000. So it varies a lot depending on who's in, in power in the White House. But about a quarter of 1% of our population is um, refugees in the United States. The number of refugees that we receive is and have in the United States is relatively is pretty large in terms of raw numbers, which makes sense because we're a very large number. In terms of percentage of the total population, it's pretty middle of the road. There, we're, there are some countries that receive um, less refugees per capita, some of the European countries. Uh, there are other countries that receive a lot more refugees per capita, Canada being a really good example, they over, over twice the number of refugees per capita that we receive. Uh, so anyways, that's a little bit about refugee law, in case you were curious, but we do have many refugees in Anchorage and Alaska more generally, as well as a lot of people that aren't refugees, but are just have migrated to the United States. And among our Anchorage school district, you can see some of that diversity reflected. There are 94 languages spoken in the homes of students of the Anchorage school district by the school district's own estimate, uh, which includes Spanish, Hmong, and many other languages as well, Korean, um, Tagalog, a variety of languages. We have um, a relatively large number of people that are um, Asian and or Pacific Islander, so AAPI. And not only that, but the what's interesting there is not so much the number as um, how that's distributed, right? So here in the United States, or sorry, here in Alaska, in Cook Inlet, 
um, we have a very large Filipino community, whereas in many other parts of the country, kind of the global total average, it's something like 20% of the Asian community. In Alaska, it's in Anchorage, it's closer to like 50%. And overall, 2.7% of the population of Alaska is Filipino. So that is a large Filipino presence. And it's not just a large Filipino-American presence, but one that goes back a very long time. Um, some people are obviously more recent arrivals, but Filipino people have been emigrating to Alaska um, really as long as anybody else has been emigrating to Alaska. Uh, you start to get records in the historical records of Filipino people being involved on fur trading ships as early as about 1789 in American whaling ships as early as 1848 uh, during that time. Many Filipino people had a lot of interaction with a variety of indigenous coastal people as a result of being on those whaling ships, uh, such as Inupiaq people. And actually, you can look at Inupiaq and find words that are um, in one of the Inupiaq dialects that's got um, essentially Filipino loanwords in it, words that are from Filipino languages. Um, also, a lot of interaction between Filipino people and Aleut people, where a lot of the fur trading operations were going on. And so you still have populations of people in some of the Aleutian Islands, you have people that are descended from Filipino people or descended from Filipino and Aleut people. And then um, down in kind of Juneau, southeast kind of area, you have a not insignificant number of people historically where Filipino men married um, Klingit women, among other things. And so that's actually was kind of a birthplace for some of the uh, Filipino American activism and um, social organizations that arose kind of in Southeast Alaska, because there was a group of people who were both Filipino and Klingit families, and they felt like they needed a kind of home uniquely for themselves. And so that was part of the formation of some of the Filipino um, social organizations down in Lake Juneau. So Filipino people came as part of whaling. Um, more people through cannery work, as we read about last week, a lot of people came as a part of the cannery um, operations in the late 1800s. Um, faced a lot of issues, including a lot of discrimination, but many ended up laying down roots here. Uh, there was Filipino people who were highly skilled cable layers, and so they were recruited to come to Alaska in the kind of early 1900s. Uh, you had a lot of people that got involved, Filipino people, in work in the gold mining industry that was going on in early 1900s in Alaska. And then you had just more generally, kind of as all this evolved and more and more Filipino people had come to Alaska, you had the formation of what is sometimes called the Alaskaros population. But basically, uh, Filipino people who in the summer would work up in Alaska and then during the winter go and work in places like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so yeah, very, very long history here. Uh, this is a picture of Thelma Bukult is I think how you would pronounce that. Uh, she was a state representative from 1974 to 1982, a Filipino woman, and she was a uh, author. In fact, a lot of what I was just telling you, that history is from her own book that she wrote about uh, Filipino history in Alaska, uh, as well as an activist and a community organizer, did a lot of important things for Filipino American community in Alaska more generally during her time. Uh, and you can still see that presence today in a lot of different ways. For example, with the group called the Filipino Community of Anchorage, which holds cultural events, among other things, uh, here at UAA, the Filipino American Club, a lot of other examples that we could point to. So, really cool part of who we are as Cook Inlet. Um, another group that there are a lot of people from um, here in Alaska, and where we have a larger percentage than like the rest of the United States, is Hmong people. So... Um, Hmong people in Alaska have a more recent history overall. Well, that may be the wrong way of saying it, but I should say that a lot of Hmong people um, came about as a result of something that happened in the mid-20th century. So Hmong people are an ethnic group that lives in several different countries, none of which are they the majority in. Uh, and one of those countries is Laos. A lot of Hmong people historically lived in Laos. From 1961 to 1975, the CIA recruited Hmong people slash funded slash worked with Hmong people in Laos um, to stop a sort of communist um, revolutionary group that was trying to gain power in Laos. This was part of sort of the U.S.'s broader geostrategic goals of during the Vietnam War, not wanting multiple different communist governments to pop up in Southeast Asia. Uh, and indeed, Laos had Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese soldiers that were in Laos that were part of this sort of Laotian civil war. And so Hmong people fought on the anti-communist side um, with the 
training and collaboration of the CIA, and uh, I think mostly just providing arms, if anything, but anyways, with the CIA, and then they were given agreements that they would um, be emigrated to the United States. So that ended up, what ended up happening is when the U.S. withdrew on May 15th, 1975 from Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese and Laotian communist forces um, rapidly attacked the Hmong population in retribution, and Hmong people fled to Thailand, and thousands of Hmong people died along the way. It's a very sad story. It was horrific. Um, and then, since then, there's been a Hmong population pretty prominently in Thailand from Laos, and Hmong people have slowly come to the U well, not so slowly, but have come to the United States over time. So some of them immediately after this forced exodus to Thailand, a lot of Hmong people relocated to the United States uh, with U.S. approval and the U.S. arranging that. Others, it took a lot longer for a variety of different reasons. Um, there were still people, there were century Laotian Hmong refugees in Thailand that were still being relocated to the U.S. as late as like 2004, at least. So yeah, that's something that took decades, um, which is its own story. The in 2000, the U.S. passed a law called the Hmong Veterans Naturalization Act, and it held that Hmong um, veterans, we'll get back to that term in a minute, but Hmong veterans, um, it loosened the requirements on speaking English to get full citizenship in recognition of the role that Hmong people had played in those foreign conflicts. So, the concept of a veteran. Um, Formally speaking, those Hmong people in Laos were not veterans the way that's typically defined in the U.S. Um, because the CIA is not a branch of the military. However, there's been increasing pushes to sort of recognize Hmong people that went through that conflict and were part of that conflict as veterans of a U.S. foreign conflict. And so that's where you get Hmong Veterans Naturalization Act. And then May 15th here in Alaska, is the which is the same day as when the forces withdrew from Vietnam. Uh, May 15th is recognized now, a few years ago, as Hmong American Veterans Memorial Day in Anchorage, which I think is very cool. Uh, so there are about 6,000 Hmong people living in Anchorage. It's about 2% of the city. So about 1 in 50 people you meet in Anchorage is Hmong. They come for a variety of reasons. Some folks emigrated directly to Alaska um, and then and there's been a tendency with Hmong migration for people to kind of go to certain parts of the country to be around other um, people from their own cultural background, which makes a lot of sense. There's also been folks from the lower 48 places like Minnesota um, that are Hmong emigrating up to Alaska. There was an interview with Brady Yang, who is Hmong, and Brady said that a big reason for that is because Alaska has like a really similar weather and topography uh, to Laos that it feels like home and the interviewer is like really like it doesn't even snow in Laos and Reddy Yang was like well yeah sure it doesn't snow in Laos but I guess unless on top of like a high mountain or something but yeah it doesn't snow in Laos but um, it's mountainous like Laos and it has really cool summers like Laos so it feels like Laos which I thought was fascinating the way in which our sense of place imprints on us and calls us home if not to our own place because we can't go back, then to places that are like our place. Are very interesting. Um, you could say similar, for example, for the um, relatively large number of Nordic immigrants that came to Alaska. Sweden, traditionally um, in Laos, most Hmong people were Sweden horticulturists, so that means um, what we sometimes call slash and burn farmers, and working in tropical forests. Of course, here in Alaska, that's not possible uh, for a variety of different reasons, including that we don't live in tropical forests and that we wouldn't allow slash and burn agriculture because of the forest fire risks, uh, besides which just subsistence farming in that sense is not really something that's done very often in Alaska for a variety of reasons. However, the Hmong population here continues to have, um, for many people, a really strong gardening tradition, um, gardening including for traditional Hmong vegetables. And so there was a thesis done a few years back by a person by the name of Brady, and she found that in one of the community gardens here, where there's like 50 plots that community members can rent, 35 of the plots were being rented by Hmong people, which is obviously a lot more than 2%. So disproportionately represented for sure. Uh, so gardening continues to be a strong tradition for Hmong people, which is really cool. Um, and there's a story by one of the people who runs community gardens in Anchorage. He was telling a story in one of those articles and he was saying, you know, one time um, 
we were talking to some people that were recent Hmong immigrants to the area and explaining like, hey, you're going to need to make sure to fence your garden because of the moose. We all know once you've been here for a year or two, you know that, you know, the moose come by and nibble on your gardens. And so they were saying like, they were talking to folks about that. And then the um, Hmong gardeners they were talking to just like went over to some nearby trees and like cut down a bunch of saplings and then like immediately made it into like a really cool like fence operation around the garden, which I think is like such an awesome story, right? Uh, people's traditional ecological like, knowledge from where they used to be carried over into this new environment, right? Um, another interesting thing about Hmong people is, in Alaska is that we have cultural celebrations that you'll sometimes see in the city, including Hmong New Year celebration in the autumn, which is a time to, among other things, honor ancestors and the turning of the seasons. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you can see a picture of it here from 2016. Another thing to mention is that there are some unique medical needs for the Hmong community. Um, so many scholars have written about sort of the medical needs of Hmong Americans and how the cultural sort of healing practices, which are often called Wan Neve, which means both shamanism, but also the overall healing system of Hmong people, that it's often quite different um, from sort of the more allopathic U.S. biomedical approach that most doctors in the U.S. are practicing. Obviously, there's also different kinds of holistic or naturopath practitioners and stuff like that, but most doctors are practicing a way of medicine that operates on a very different cosmology than sort of traditional uh, among healing. That actually came out, that was relevant recently with the COVID vaccine. So somebody that was a community worker uh, who was running a vaccine clinic was interviewed by the daily, by one of the local news sources, I think, and she mentioned um, that, you know, there were some difficulties with ha getting, encouraging people to get COVID vaccinated, including number one, that folks tended to lean a lot on herbal medicines, um, rather than sort of conventional pharmaceutical medicines that would come from the pharmaceutical industry, um, that might be more common. And so vaccines were viewed with some suspicion as a result. Um, there was also issues with translation, how to translate some of the subtleties of different things and differences between different types of vaccines um, to elders. A lot of young people are, by, are would be fluent in English and Hmong, or mainly speaking English, um, but a lot of older people speak primarily Hmong, and so it was difficult to translate for some of the elderly people. And so, you know, it reminds us if we do any sort of healthcare, social work, um, philanthropy, whatever it be, or just any sort of public um, outward facing thing up in Anchorage or anywhere else in Alaska that we need to be thoughtful about the different populations that we work with and make sure we understand their unique needs as well as where they're coming from culturally speaking. Uh, a guy I know by the name of Jacob Hickman teaches at BYU now used to be at University of Chicago uh, which is where he did his graduate work. He wrote a great paper back in uh, 2008 I think it was or 2006 called Is It the Spirit of the Body? Syncretism of Health Beliefs Among Hmong Migrants to Alaska and one of the po immigrants to Alaska and one of the points that he brought up is that okay you have this traditional healing system and that traditional healing system illness is typically caused by spirit loss or publique something where your spirit actually departs from your body or your spirits because you have a shock like an intense like fright like maybe a car almost hits you or something or because um, a hostile spirit's taking that. So it could be from spirit loss, it could be from hostile spirits, or it could be sometimes from strained or poor ancestral relationships, relationships with ancestral spirits, that these things can contribute to your illnesses. Um, and there's been a tendency to sort of, as he puts it, um, what is the term he uses? Well, it's basically like reify or exoticize and treat this as like entirely different from US medicine, right? But as he points out, um, instead, people in Anchorage, where he did his interviews, have often merged, right, um, the different healing systems. He says members of the community in Anchorage have merged aspects of both perspectives and have come to develop the necessary rationale for adopting seemingly contradictory philosophies, right, two very different worldviews, spiritual causes, than these very sort of pathogenic, we can put it in a test tube causes, but he says they found ways to adopt those seemingly contradictory philosophies. He says this elucidates how the Hmong are more holistic than typical adherents of the biomedical paradigm in their medical reasoning. He's like, um, doctors don't feel comfortable blending Hmong worldview and Western medicine worldview, but Hmong people definitely feel blending the two, so in a sense they're more holistic. He says they do not see their traditional health system as mutually exclusive to the Western biomedical paradigm, whereas many Westerners view the two systems as just so. And he, he's got a great, like, graphic on this, but he basically says um, that people 
those he interviewed, and again, this was back in 2008, so there's probably been a lot of change um, in the past decade and a half, but he says, you know, at the time, people would often, if it was kind of a regular disease, and also if there was other indications that something spiritual was involved, and if it lasted for a long time, then you tended to think of it as a dab, as a spirit, uh, and then you would often go to healing techniques, whether that's herbal medicines, whether that's a shaman, things like this, and if it cured it, then great, and that has confirmed that it was a spiritual cause, but if it failed to cure, or if it was a really strange disease that hadn't been encountered regularly, something odd, if there weren't really reasons to think a spirit was involved, if it was like a short duration, that was oftentimes where people would go to a clinic, go to a doctor, and then but the converse of the first thing I just said is that if the Western doctors didn't fix things, people would often say, well, maybe this is a spiritual condition and go and consult shamans, for example. And so um, it's really kind of fascinating, right? People recognizing both traditional agents of disease in the form of spirits and then biomedical agents of disease in the forms of pathogens, recognizing both of those realities and going to different practitioners, sometimes both types, to kind of figure out, well, what's specifically going on here? Uh, people are very holistic often in the ways they approach their own health, uh, oftentimes more holistic than the medical practitioners they go to. So that's just a little bit about um, some of the two of the communities that we have here that um, are from originally migrant populations, so Filipino Americans and Hmong Americans, and I wish I could cover all the different migrant groups or migrant descended groups here in Cook Inlet. I cannot, uh, partly for time, partly because I don't have the knowledge base to cover all these different groups, but I hope that uh, the two groups we focused on really shows you, again, some of the diversity and complexity right here of our own community and some of the cultural diversity of our own community right here, uh, so that we can be respectful and not just sort of assume a homogeneity that's not there. Uh, we live in a rich tapestry here in Cook Inlet.